Is this the oldest deity known to mankind? Hello my friends, welcome back to this channel and back to this series of videos I'm making called Deity Tracker, where I will be tracking various divinities through the forests of time and human culture. And today we will be looking at the horned god, Serenunos, and we'll be asking the question, is this the oldest deity known to mankind? So before I uh, begin with this, I'd like to caveat this. I am a storyteller in the oral tradition and a folklorist and a mythologist. These are interconnected disciplines. I am not a professional historian or archeologist, although I have uh, been an academic. I've studied, I've walked through those corridors. I leave all of that behind in these videos because I think as a sort of grassroots folklorist, your nose is a bit closer to the ground and you can make connections both with history and archaeology back through time and with folklore, both written and oral. Uh, and you can sort of look at the whole wider picture, just like you're tracking an animal through the forest and get a better sense of the journey this god has taken through time and history and culture, which is a forest, it's a labyrinth, um, and that is particularly fitting for this god. Uh, but because of that, uh, I, I may be less conservative than an academic will, will be, and I, I might make statements that are, are, are quite broad in making connections and seeing resonances and images. Um, it's almost like in a lot of old folklore stories, like the story of Finn McCool, there's a point in his youth when he's growing up in a forest where he moves from tracking animals to trapping them. I think a lot of academic disciplines are about trapping uh, animals. Being a folklorist is about tracking. You're following your nose, you're close to the ground. Um, spiel over. But the point is, if you hear anything in this video which either you haven't heard before, let me know in the comments, or something you disagree with, let me know in the comments, or if I've missed anything, which I'm sure to because this is all off the cuff, let me know in the comments, and do please give this video a like. So. Serenunos, the horned god or antlered god, god of the wild, lord of the animals, uh, god of trade and commerce, uh, lord of the underworld sometimes, god of the crossroads that looks in many directions, and ancient guide, friend to mankind. <laughs> when we think of the horned god, uh, there's an image that often pops up in our mind if you're sort of familiar with mythologies and gods and pantheons and it probably probably comes from contemporary paganism or wicca i guess there'll be a sort of a deer headed uh man sitting cross-legged there might be like a pentangle or a pentagram somewhere on him and he'll have antlers he might have a talk or I'll be holding a serpent he'll probably be under the moonlight um he might have hoofs um and maybe sort of deer haunches, that kind of thing. Um, I will talk about the contemporary pagan or Wiccan version of the horned god, maybe more towards the end, because I think it, it, it is part of the whole journey of this antlered deity. Uh, but first, I think I'm going to begin with where the god gets his name from. Serenunos or Kerunos or Kerunos um, is a Gaelic, a Gallic, French, uh, Romano Gallic deity. Uh, and he only appears once. There's only one instance that I'm aware of that he appears with his image, with his name, and it's quite chipped. Uh, I'll put it up on the screen. It's on something called the Pillar of the Boatman. That's important. Uh, and it shows a just a bearded face, really, with horns, either bull's horns or very short, cropped antlers with two torques hanging on them. A torque is a symbol of uh, aristocracy and um, elite status in Celtic society. It's a kind of um, usually gold neckband. It's like a king wears a crown. Celtic chieftains wore torques around their necks. So he's got two on his antlers, uh, a sign of wealth. One of the things that Kerenunos and the horned god is associated with. Um, it looks like 
from the pillar of the boatman that he's seated, he's in a seated posture. He might well be holding a torque in another hand or maybe a money pouch or maybe a cornucopia, symbol of sort of fertility and um, abundance. Um, there's various other gods on this uh, seal as well. Some just strictly Roman like Jupiter and others more Celtic. Just as a side note, we don't see Celtic deities presented in anthropomorphic form, in human form, uh, ever really, until the Romans arrive. And then suddenly it's like shining a light on this whole cosmos of Celtic deities, some of which may be local versions of the same overarching deity or completely separate ones, we don't really know. But uh, the, the Iron Age Celts before the Roman arrives never actually made statues or images of their gods. We don't really know why, maybe just because they're so elemental and abstract to put them in human form is a bit um, weird. Uh, that would be my guess. Um, but yes, this pillar of the boatman, the only time we see the horned god given the name Kerninos, and we now give that name Kerninos to any antlered or horned god, usually, including the contemporary pagan one, um, and that's just how it is. Kerninos uh, means horned one, so it does kind of make sense. Uh, the part of England that is Celtic, Cornwall, is also etymologically linked. It means horn. So it's interesting that this Kerninos is on uh, the pillar of the Boatman, which would have been on the banks of the Seine, a sacred river now in Paris. It would have been the head of the uh, Parisi tribe, a Celtic tribe, before Julius Caesar came along and bashed them on the head and took over. Um, but people who travel over water uh, and also uh, their, uh, their traders, their merchants, it was erected by merchants. So a god here of moving over water by boat uh and uh, commerce and wealth and generating wealth which is interesting given Kerenos's associations also with the underworld which is also a realm of um uh, gold and gems always in mythology think about pluto and hades they're always associated with uh, uh wealth also traveling over water by boat a bit like um a bit like Charon, the boatman uh, a bit like many other psychopomps which is a word for a guide in the afterlife. So that's another role that Kerenos has that is kind of resonates with this pillar of the boatman here, because uh, it would have been a place where lots of um, boats would have come. It also would have been at a crossroads, an intersection of road and water. And Kerenos, the horned god, is again a god of uh, multi-directionality, of thresholds, of crossing over, crossing a threshold of life into death or um, uh, or civilization into the wilderness, or uh, the human into the divine, that will become relevant later, this threshold crossing God, and almost um, guardian of the threshold, if you know what I mean. So, pillar of the boatman, we've got Kerenos there. Uh, now let's compare the image that most people um, probably have in their heads, if it's not the neo-pagan version of Kerenos. I'm sure you're all familiar with this image. Uh, it's sort of where the uh, neo-pagan and Wiccan image of Kerenos derives from. Uh, it's the horned god on the Gundestrup cauldron that I've talked about a lot on this channel. It's a most magnificent object. It's a silver ritual bowl or cauldron that was found in a bog in Denmark, way outside the Celtic world. It may have been made in, in sort of, you know, Southeast Europe, um, Thrace, uh, or it may have been made in Gaul in France, maybe made in Britain. We just don't know. Um, but it has Celtic iconography as well as a mixture of other iconography. I've got some of it tattooed on my arm here. There's a sort of resurrecting cauldron uh, depicted inside the bowl. Um, with a kind of god dunking warriors in it that re-emerge. I only mention that because of this rebirth resurrection theme that might become relevant later. But on another plate inside this bowl, there is this horned dude. The reason we call, we normally call this guy Kerenos, despite the fact that that name isn't written on the bowl, is because of some similar iconography with the Gaulish pillar of the boatman Kerenos. He's holding a talk. He's also wearing a talk. He's sat cross-legged. This is quite a rare thing in um, in iconography of the time. It's all, we associate that much more with Eastern gods, with Hindu and Buddhist 
uh, figures and deities and iconography that's going to become relevant in a minute but he's seated he's got antlers he's holding a talk uh, he's on what broadly could be described as a celtic bowl elsewhere there's sort of caranxes you know those celtic trumpets on it it's obviously got celtic iconography so we can call this koninos but there's other things going on here as well if you look at this figure to me this is my interpretation this is a shamanic figure. He sat in a yogic posture. Uh, he's surrounded by, if you look, uh, a pattern of leaves surrounded by dot work. And this is just my personal idea. No one's ever said this before, but this reminds me of uh, being under the influence of certain hallucinogens. And if you compare it to artwork, say ayahuasca artwork from the Peruvian or Ecuadorian or Brazilian Amazon uh, shamans, herbalists that take the drink ayahuasca um, and look at the artwork produced by those shamans such as Pablo Amaringo. There's a similar thing going on here. Also on the, the panel, uh, there's a dude riding a dolphin or porpoise. We also see that in Amazonian art. So I, 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 think, I think this is a god of shamanism as well. I've got other evidence to back that up, which I'll get on to. Uh, you will also note <laughs> on this figure he's surrounded by animals in fact he seems to have a connection with a dog and a deer uh, again uh, emphasizing the shamanic context having a either animal familiars or animal spirit guides or seeing through the eyes of animals or transforming into animals this is a very shamanic concept it also is why we call Kerolinos the lord of the animals or the lord of the wild because he's surrounded by all these beasties uh, mainly deer and dogs, uh, things like that, and snakes. You notice he's holding a horned snake in his hand. Snakes often symbolize water because they're like rivers, also air. Um, they're often, often dual-natured, uh, dragons and things like that, um, because they dwell in water and under the earth, but also in the sky. They're also associated with fire. They're a dual-natured thing, which again is relevant to Koninos. He's, 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 a, he's almost a dual aspect or sometimes triple aspected deity. Now, this figure on the Gundestrup bowl, uh, this antlered deity, this uh, god of the wild, this lord of the animals, uh, this shamanic seated god, compare this image to another image that I'll put on the screen in, in a minute. Uh, this is from a completely unconnected civilization in a different part of the world. This is the Indus Valley seal, possibly the most famous of the Indus Valley seals. The Indus Valley, uh, the Indus Valley civilization was a civilization that it, it was one of the first civilizations that ever produced writing around the same time as ancient sort of Sumeria. Uh, it flourished in uh, what is present day Pakistan. Um, we still haven't deciphered the text. Uh, and then it collapsed when the Indo Europeans uh, rolled in over them, the Vedic people, the ancestors of. Um, Europeans and Indians today, and Persians and uh, a lot of other people in between. Um, I'm not going to go on about the Indo-Europeans, but this Indus Valley seal, look at the similarity here between the horned god on the Gundestrap cauldron. He's surrounded by wild beasts. He's seated in a yogic posture. He's horned. Uh, note these are either um, bull or buffalo horns. Uh, symbolically speaking, they mean very different things. Uh, Bullhorns are normally sort of fertility uh, in, a, in a very male sense. Uh, buffalo horns, because they don't produce milk, often more represent demonic or wild forces. Um, so it could be two or both things going on there. He's also got three faces. Uh, yeah, that is one of the reasons, among many, why this Indus Valley seal is connected with the Hindu god Shiva. Now Shiva comes centuries later, but many people say this is a proto-Shiva via the Vedic Rudra. Uh, there's lots of reasons for that. Um, Shiva is called the Lord of the Animals, Pashupati, and here we have a seated yogic figure surrounded by animals, a lot like the iconography of Shiva. Shiva also often has three faces. This is to um, highlight his uh, supremacy as the actual king of the gods, not just the destroyer. So uh, one face usually means the past, one means the present, one means the future. So he's omniscient. Uh, also, sometimes his 
quality as creator, destroyer, and maintainer, uh, inst instead of those roles being split between Vishnu and Shiva and Brahma. Um, so this is Shiva. Um, Shiva is also a dual aspected god. He's the god of yogis. That's why he's always sat in a yogic posture. That's why he's sat on a lion's skin or a tiger's skin because he's conquered the five senses. Uh, but he's also the god of uh, eroticism, of sexuality, of fertility. And those things should be opposite. You know, if you're meditating, you can't be thinking about tits all day, can you? Um, so uh, these are contrary principles uh, that are unified in the god Shiva, uh, which again is relevant to Konanos. But it's interesting that this Indus Valley god, we don't know who it is, we don't know what it represents, but is um, connected to Shiva, because I would argue that Shiva is also connected in a very roundabout way to the horned god. It's interesting that Shiva often has a half moon in his hair, uh, just like contemporary depictions in Wiccan society of the horned god. The half moon represents the horns uh, and many, many other things as well. So a connection with Shiva there uh, via Rudra to this Indus Valley seal, even though this Indus Valley seal is an ancient civilization before Indo-European civilization. So if it is connected to this image on the Gundistrap cauldron, either, um, either there's an earlier connecting civilization that we don't know about, or that both images have emerged out of the collective human unconscious. That is a very Jungian way of looking at it, but that is the way I prefer to look at it. Let me know what you think. Um, so yeah, if we're going backwards then, if we're looking for this earlier horned deity that may have given rise to the Indus Valley seal, horned god, to the horned god of the Gundestruck cauldron, and the Serenunos on the pillar of the boatman, and indeed other horned deities. I'll talk about Greco-Roman horned gods in a while, but let's, uh, I want to stick with um, Britain. Uh, for a while because the horned god is very very popular in Britain and there's a horned god there is a horned god from the north of Britain that it's hard to date because it's carved in sandstone uh, but it's he's a bit different but it's uh, probably pre-Celtic so I, I'm suggesting this is a very early god that has seeped into later iconographies because uh, that's often how this works so this horned god is different. Um, he's got little horns. Um, we can't tell what they are. They might be goat horns. He's holding a spear and a shield and his, his genitals are showing. So this is uh, probably a fertility god, but also maybe a sort of battle god or god of bashing stuff. This is going to become relevant because I also believe the god Odin or Wodin is connected to the antlered god uh, or Serenos, again in a roundabout way. So there's a web here, there's a web of all these later deities going back and merging with this um, earlier horned god. If we go back further, uh, in the Mesolithic in Britain, we find grave goods that are deer skulls made into masks with eye holes and uh, uh, attachments so they could be, you know, have a leather strap or something around the back and antlers. Sometimes the antlers have been chopped off a lot like the, um, <laughs> the figure on the pillar of the boatman. Now, the usual consensus, some people say these were um, these uh, uh, sort of Mesolithic masks were used for hunting. I think that's ridiculous and anyone who suggests that should be thrown in the sea. But um, it's quite clear to me and most people that these are shamanic objects. These are uh, masks that a shaman will wear in a ritual. So this connects back to the um, horned god being a god of shamanism. Now, the reason I say that or one of the reasons I say that is because of Siberian shamanism. Look at this image here of a Tungus shaman wearing a very similar deer headdress. Now the, this indigenous community in Siberia is probably one of the very few in Europe that has been unchanged for millennia. Um, compare Aboriginal Australians or Amazonian um, peoples that have lived the same way of life for tens of thousands of years. So this um, Tungus shaman uh, that was viewed and recorded in sort of the 18th, 19th centuries. Uh, this, I think, is a snapshot of what our ancestors would have done uh, in Britain and other parts of Europe. And that's what these deer headdresses are all about. So I think it's, in a way, cosplaying the horned god. It's channeling the horned god energy. 
And again, these Siberian shamans, sometimes they, uh, 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 in their, in their other world imaginations, transform into animals like deer riding into other worlds. Um, they often also associate with um, dogs and crows and wolves and ravens. Uh, and yeah, go through, go on flights through the night sky, often with the aiding of um, supernatural, I mean, hallucinogenic aids like the fly, um, fly agaric mushroom. This again brings me back to um, Odin, so I'll get to this in a minute. But staying with this deer headdress for a while, this shamanic ritual object and this antlered god, if we go even further back in time to the art of the Lascaux caves in France um, and other parts of Europe like Spain and the cave art of about 40,000 years ago when there's this flourishing of art and culture suddenly in Europe, it's like suddenly a light bulb goes on. There's Stone Age humans, Stone Age humans, Stone Age humans, Stone Age humans for most of human existence and they're very boring, they don't really make art and then suddenly all this cave art appears. And what do we see in this cave art? Well, for one thing, uh, drawings and evidence of magic mushrooms. I made a separate video about that. But also we see uh, a lot of deer and a lot of imagery that can only be described, in my opinion, as shamanic. A lot of therianthropic entities, which is just a fancy word for uh, a part human, part animal being. The most common is a part human, part deer god. It's sometimes called um, the magician or the Lord of the Forest again. Could this be the very beginning of the Horned God 40,000 years ago? Now, this is a bold claim because we know very little about the culture of humans that made these um, cave paintings, apart from they were hunter-gatherers. Um, but there's a certain, there's a, there's an initiation aspect to these caves as well. Sometimes you have to go into smaller and smaller caves and most of the community are, are only allowed in the main cave at the bottom but the um, there's evidence that uh, maybe a shaman or guru or leader and his initiates uh, would go into the deep, deep, um, hard to reach caverns where some of this imagery lies. Almost reminds me of the Eleusinian mysteries, a very early version of it. The reason I mention this, or one of the reasons I mention this, is the shamanic context, but also this is the almost the emergence of humanity. And that's one of the things that the horned god is said to represent. He's the ancient guide of mankind. It's almost like he's guided us out of the animal world, out of the wild, out of the forests of uh, the unconscious mind, where we used to be beasts, and we've kind of evolved physically and, and culturally to become humans that enjoy art and, you know, language and song and story. The horned, this antlered figure was there at that beginning. It's like he's been holding our hand and guiding us out of the, um, out of the forest, out of the dark. I'd also like to talk now a little bit about um, the Greco-Roman world and the Mediterranean because this horned god does appear there as well. That English, that North English horned god, that Bronze Age horned god I mentioned earlier, uh, on the same piece of rock there is carved many labyrinths, sort of rings of concentric circles with a maze going through. The labyrinth symbolizes many things. It symbolizes the forest, it symbolizes the subconscious mind, it symbolizes the underworld. The most famous labyrinth, as I'm sure you're aware, in human culture is probably the labyrinth of the Minotaur on Crete in what is now Greece, the middle of the Mediterranean. This is an ancient civilization, far older than the ancient Greek civilization, uh, and I think possibly even older than the Egyptian civilization, or around the same. Uh, but the Minotaur is the guardian of the center of the labyrinth. Of course, bullhorned, a therianthropic entity there. Uh, but almost this, this guardian of the maze, this guardian of the of the forest, if you like, this guardian of the underworld. And it was under the palace of King Minos, probably also where he kept his wealth. Um, 
uh, obviously later Greek mythology has developed this idea of the lab of the Minotaur of the labyrinth. We don't know really what the ancient Minoan civilization concept of it would have been, but a lot of bull imagery in a labyrinth and a lot of coins um, with a labyrinth on the underside. Uh, again, linking the labyrinth and the underworld and the horned god to wealth and currency, even in the ancient world. A little bit later in sort of Mediterranean um, civilization, we have a few other gods that are horned gods. Uh, Sylvanus, the god of the forest, is an obvious one to mention. Um, also, of course, of course, of course, the god Pan, the god of uh, or Faunus, I think he's called in Roman mythology, uh, the, god of, of, uh, the god of mischief, the god of wildness, the god of doing um, taboo things. Again, that's a link to Shiva. Shiva does taboo things. He lives in cremation grounds and uh, uh, does things that you're not supposed to do to give him magical power. So another weird little link there. Uh, but Pan, um, yeah, the god, the god of uh, revelry, the god of uh, the god of wildness. Uh, again, slightly linked to Dionysus there. Uh, but Pan's worth a mention here. Um, there's quite an interesting image uh, of um, Pan. Uh, having sex with a goat uh, that I'll include here just you know because it's quite fun but again an idea of a, a, a fertility god as well a lot of resonating themes with the sort of wider um, umbrella package of this uh, horned god Now I would like to talk about folklore, uh, and this is probably my specialist subject, and this is where I see the link here between uh, the horned gods of the Greco-Roman and Celtic world uh, all the way through into contemporary uh, paganism and Wicca, uh, because these have been preserved in folklore. Uh, I should also say, um, just as a side issue, the horned god has also been preserved in Christian mythos as Satan. Uh, often, if you look at images of the devil, like, say, on the tarot card, we see a cross-legged figure with uh, deer haunches, more like Pan, actually, and uh, goat horns, again, more like Pan, but this horned uh, god. Uh, perhaps a... Um, a sort of rejection of old pagan ways and old pagan horned gods that were still still had a bit of residue even in the early days of Christianity. So maybe as recasting the horned god as the devil, that was Christianity's way of sort of stamping out these um, uh, earlier pagan resonances of horned gods. I don't want to talk too much about Christianity though. Um, I'm going to talk about folklore. So in the very early um, Welsh and uh, British and also French material of King Arthur, which is derived on Celtic folklore, we have a figure that keeps appearing. So I'm going to read you a passage now from a uh, grail myth, uh, one of the legends of King Arthur. I will tell this story on this channel one day because it's great. It's called The Knight with the Lion or uh, The Lady of the Fountain. And there's two versions. There's a Welsh one, which is probably earlier, and a, and, and a French one. Hear this. He went into the wilderness and came to a large glade where he saw sitting a black man of great stature on top of a mound. He was not smaller in size than two men of this world, and he was exceedingly ill-favoured, having but one foot and one eye in the middle of his forehead. He carried a club of iron of huge size, and he was the woodward of the wood, and the master and lord of the wilderness. Owain beheld a thousand wild animals grazing around him, and when he struck a stag so great a blow with his club that it brayed vehemently, all the animals came together, as numerous as the stars in the sky, so that it was difficult to find room in the glade to stand among them. And there were serpents and dragons and diverse sorts of animals. However, Owain did not shrink from this terrifying circumstance, but went up to the giant and asked him of his road. And perceiving him to be dauntless, the lord of the wilderness pointed out the way. Isn't that brilliant? We have so many... Um, uh, so many symbolic resonances with uh, other images of the horned god in uh, archaeology and history there. Uh, a fearsome 
uh, one here, you know, like, like the Minotaur, like, um, like that willy waving um, uh, god of the north of England, horned god, uh, but also association with serpents, with animals, um, a guide, he's got one eye, uh, he sat on a mound, uh, almost like a burial mound, he's in the forest, uh, the animals are like stars in the sky, there's a cosmos um, and an underworld symbology, all, all here um, in a tale that is not really about a horned god. He doesn't have antlers, this one, I grant you, or horns, but a lot of the other symbology is, is dead on. Elsewhere in Celtic mythology, we have, um, in very early stories of Merlin, Meridi, uh, I think that's how you pronounce it, um, Merlin is a wild man lost in the woods, and he rides deer and commands whole hosts of deer. Again, some resonance is there. Uh, also, various lords of the underworld and lords of the spectral hunt. In the old Welsh literature, uh, the god of the underworld sometimes rides out of the earth on a spectral hunt, leading the spirits of the dead on, on a kind of hunt through the forest before disappearing back underneath a burial mound. We also have this in, in Greek mythology as well, uh, where the wild hunt, the spectral hunt, is led by the goddess Diana. This appears in later English folklore in many, 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 many versions with this figure called Hearn the Hunter that you might have heard of. There's so many versions of this story. Uh, one day on this channel, I'll tell the local Wiltshire one that's sort of based in a forest just over there. Um, not in this forest. Uh, but basically, Hearn, it, it, Hearn appears in the plays of William Shakespeare, where he's an antlered figure that is also ghostly and walks around an oak tree in Windsor Great Park. Uh, in another version of this folklore, uh, he is a huntsman that saves King Richard from being gored by a deer. He sacrifices his life and is then betrayed by other huntsmen, by his own people, and is hung uh, from an oak tree until dead, uh, and then forever roams Windsor uh, Forest on his um, horse with his two black spectral hounds behind him until he... Um, uh, until all the other huntsmen that betrayed him go mad and join his spectral hunt, and he can forever be seen riding uh, through Windsor Great Park, particularly around uh, winter solstice. So that's the legend of Hearn the Hunter, one version of the Lord of the Spectral Hunt, or the Lord of the Wild Hunt, uh, which is a very common sort of archetypal motif in, in European mythology. If you're watching this video from somewhere else in Europe and you have a version of the wild hunt or the spectral hunt, let me know. The version I'm gonna tell uh, soon on this channel, the Lord of the Spectral Hunt isn't Hearn, it's Wodin. It's the one-eyed Anglo-Saxon god Wodin, or as we know him more commonly by his uh, Scandinavian name, Odin. And in Scandinavia, there are also folkloric versions of the spectral hunt where Odin is their leader. This is important because this connects the god Odin to the antlered god. There are other things that connect the god Odin to the horned or antlered god, uh, many of them. Uh, Odin is a magician like the horned god. Odin is associated with uh, dogs and wolves, uh, but also crows and ravens. Odin is a psychopomp, a guide. Uh, Odin is associated often with the underworld sometimes, particularly in his role as a uh, leader of the spectral, spectral hunt. Uh, also, Odin sometimes has horns, or Wodin, I should say. But they're not horns, they're kind of stylized ravens in a way. Um, if you've ever seen the Sutton Who ship burial, this is an Anglo-Saxon king. I think it's King Redwald, just off the top of my head. Uh, but he is wearing armour, and it's now considered a fact that this armour is, is basically cosplaying Odin. Elsewhere on the armour, there's these two horned figures with spears and shields fighting. One's got a dog's head. Um, it's a very cool image. I'll show it on the screen now. As a side note, if you want this image on a t-shirt, I've made it. I'll put a link in the description below. You can wear it and be cool like me. Um, very cool people like me uh, call uh, these horned Wodin-like figures Wodin avatars 
in numerous environments, or Wayne for short, because Wayne is a cool name. It seems like I'm going on a sidetrack now. I'm not. Um, there's many, many, many horned, spear-carrying figures that are like Odin or Woden. Um, but on closer inspection, the horns actually look like stylized ravens. Obviously, we all know, or some of us know, that Odin has two ravens, thought and memory. Another association there. Uh, but then that there is literally linking a horned god to Odin or Woden. And I think that's really, really cool. Lots and lots to think about there. Uh, I haven't said all there is to say about this because there's so much. But um, if we follow this god through then, uh, because obviously the horned god is very popular today among contemporary pagans and Wiccans and witches, probably because it resonates with some deep unconscious image of this antlered deity. But just to sum up then, the horned god, or Keronos, is associated with all of these things. Um, the crossroads, crossing over, crossing the threshold, uh, the gallows, uh, commerce, fertility, particularly male fertility, uh, trade, travel, crossing over water, crossing over into the afterlife, into the next world, uh, the god of the wild, of the forest, of uh, our connection with the wild, um, with regeneration, rebirth, with the underworld, uh, all these things, um, and the male aspect of divinity. <clears throat> I didn't mention the wild man and uh, the green man, but these are also figures in folklore that you could say are also connected to the horned god, even though they don't normally have horns, because they're often figures of um, initiation, like uh, uh, like Iron John, like the, the hairy wild man of the Grimm's fairy tale Iron John. Uh, he's a figure of male initiation. And the green man, like... Um, like a version of the Green Man might be the Green Knight from the story Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, which is often told around Christmas time. I'll put a link to that story, I've told it on this channel. But he always symbolises death and rebirth, regeneration. He symbolises the absolute that cannot be transgressed, uh, but also a figure of initiation. So these wild men and green men of um, European folklore and art, I think are also a, a, a bridge, bridging the gap between a more ancient horned, God. So you could say, you could say this horned God has, exist, exists now in sort of contemporary paganism in Wicca, and he sort of tracked his way through the forests of human culture, through medieval European folklore. Uh, uh, he's brushed up against Odin and Woden. He's brushed up against uh, the god Mercury, you know, the, the magician of the gods, the, the guide of the gods. Uh, he's brushed up against Pan. He's brushed up against the Minotaur. He's brushed up against uh, European shamans going far, far, far back, right into the very um, emergence of humans and human civilization. So he's been there since the very beginning. He's almost like our guide, almost like our saviour. You could say he's kind of like a pagan Jesus. A lot of similar motifs there, I would say, uh, with a kind of wild, antlered Christ. In fact, there's a friend of mine, a storyteller, called Martin Shaw. He's converted to Christianity in the last few years, and he said that uh, before his conversion, he kept seeing Christ in the form of a deer. Just something to think about there. Anyway, my friends, uh, thank you very much if you've made it this far in the video. Uh, please let me know what you think in the comments. Uh, I've missed out loads, uh, but I've been, I've been meaning to make this video for a long time. Um, thank you also to all my Patreon uh, members. Uh, there you are now, including uh, my newest member, whose name is Gia, or Gia Holtz. I think I've got that right, but thank you to you. Um, if you want to support me and what I'm doing as a folklorist and a storyteller, then uh, there is a link to my Patreon account in the comments below and in the description below. Uh, thank you very much, my friends. Uh, if you want to hear more stories about Celtic and other Northern European deities, I'll put a link to the playlist at the end of this video uh, or just some other video about something.
see you again soon my friends uh nero here is getting pretty cold and it's starting to get dark and i'm in the middle of a forest so i better start walking home now thanks guys see you later Thank <music> you.